Uh, first, I wanted to thank um, the, the CPR and all the people who participated here, uh, either as uh, audience members or sharing their stories. And um, I'd like to say that I am not a subject matter expert here. I have not personally had uh, any family member or friends incarcerated at George Hill or otherwise. Um, so I'm learning a lot of this as I'm going along here. I have been learning a lot throughout the past year. I had occasion to visit uh, the George Hill Correctional Facility um, maybe after I was on council for two or three months. I just uh, took office in January. And um, I've got to say, it's quite the eye-opening experience for me personally. It is a grim place for those who haven't been there. Um, and the stories that, uh, that I'm hearing today are not uh, difficult to believe when you, when you spend any time visiting, um, visiting the George Hill facility. So I thought I could go down two paths in my comments. One, I could talk about the wisdom or foolishness of private prisons. Um, and uh, I'll touch upon that briefly, but I'm going to go down the second path because I think that path has been fairly well covered here today. Um, but just briefly, uh, in my, uh, at my night job, I run a small business. I have about 45 employees. and. Um, the one thing that we try to do as a foundation for our company is to make sure that everybody's incentives are aligned. Mm -hmm. That as the company prospers, so too will our employees, so that we're all rowing in the same direction. And similarly, we try to make sure that uh, our stakeholders, the, um, uh, the vendors that we work with, the people who support us, that we all have a common incentive. And, and that just makes it simpler. If we all know that, that we're all trying to go in the same direction, um, we, can, uh, we can get there more easily. And so when I look at the structure of a private prison, it seems that there's just perverse incentives. They're not, it's not in their interest. Their interest, they're, they're a publicly traded company. It is their obligation on behalf of their shareholders to make money. It doesn't make them good, it doesn't make them bad. That's just part of being a publicly traded company. Um, but our interest as a community is not for them to make money. Our interest is to make sure that we have a, a jail or prison uh, that, uh, that serves our county, that's, that uh, incarcerates people who are a danger to us uh, and hopefully rehabilitates those who, um, who can be rehabilitated. Um, but it's not to keep it full. You know, I, was, I, I took a look at the, um, because I do things like this, I took a look at the annual report from GEO Group. And, and if you've ever read a, an annual report filed with the SEC, you'll note that there's a, you know, there's a section where they talk about the risks to their business. And sometimes they may talk about um, geopolitical risks. If you're an oil company, you can imagine that one of the risks you might face is that there's a war. Um, most companies face credit uh, or interest rate risk if they have that debt outstanding. But uniquely uh, with the GEO Group, uh, they talk about factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from those expressed or implied by the forward-looking statements in this, in this report. And one of them is our ability to maintain or increase occupancy rates at our facilities. Mm. So they, <coughs> which, which we all know, we understand that is, that is in their, uh, we know that to be the case, but to see it in black and white in an annual report filed with the SEC that they provide to their investors, so their investors know, hey, this is a risk to us making money. If we can't keep these jails and prisons filled, you know, we might not make as much money. So I would submit to you and to all others that uh, when you have a incentives that are as poorly aligned as these are, uh, that you're setting yourself up for failure. That it's really uh, impossible to overcome overcome such a situation. Um, I was going to talk, touch briefly upon um, my own, uh, that which I've learned about private prisons, the uh, increase in, uh, in recidivism, the, um, the, the increased violence in private prisons, the sort of stuff that I've learned about the telecommunications that occurs in prisons, but we've talked about a little bit of that today. So I'm going to talk about something that I think is much more interesting, which is the legal it's actually not any more interesting, but it's something different, uh, which is the legal framework within which our prison works here in Delaware County. So to do that, and bear with me, it's, it's going to be a little legalese, but, but I think it's necessary because we have to understand the framework if we're going to understand what choices do we have to make a change. So um, Title 61 of the Pennsylvania Code is entitled Prisons and Parole, and it provides in Section 17 for the composition of a county jail oversight board, and I have it in front of me. So, um, in section 1723, um, it provides that there shall be a county jail oversight board that shall be made composed of the following. The county chief executive, in Delaware County, that would be Mary Ann Grace, two judges of the Court of Common Pleas, the county sheriff, the county controller, the president of the county council, Chairman McLean, or his designee, and then three citizen members, as provided for in subchapter C. And then there's a section of subchapter C, 
see who might be a good citizen member on this board. Um, so uh, section 1724 of Title 61 then talks about the powers and duties of this oversight board. And in general, it is to run the prison. Um, that's how it, it has the power to make all decisions with regard to the prison. Um, 1728 of this title says that this board can't enter into contracts, though. It has to come before county council first, or the county commissioner, or as pursuant to the administrative code, which in Delaware County's uh, case in section 632, requires that the chairman of the county council sign the contract after county council has approved it. But section 1723D says that counties who have our home rule charter county, like Delaware County, can opt into this section or not. And we haven't opted into this section. So it doesn't apply to us, but it easily could. If we adopted this section, we could create a new prison oversight board that would have all the people on there that, uh, that I described. Uh, importantly, three members of the population at large, citizens. And I think that would be uh, useful to have more perspectives. Um, I think, though, uh, Alyssa, if I could uh, finish here and then, and then maybe we'll answer questions later, that's okay. So, okay, so we don't have Title 61 that applies to us, but we could. Um, so then I touched briefly on the Delaware County's Administrative Code. Um, Delaware County's Administrative Code in Section 685 provides for a prison board. And um, it says that it's going to be made up of five prison inspectors who serve without compensation, three appointed by the President Judge of the Court of Common Pleas, and two by County Council. And then it provides later in that section the powers that it has. Um, but importantly, um, implies, if not states, that it doesn't have the power to enter into contracts. It still has to go before County Council before it enters into a contract. Um, Section E of the Administrative Code, though, says that nothing in our Administrative Code shall, um, shall affect powers that otherwise might be present in other, any other statute. Okay, so we have this code. doesn't seem like we're following it. So let's see what else applies. So, so the last part of this journey, we've got to jump into the Wayback Machine here. And we're going to go back to look at an act that was passed in 1839. An act passed in 1839 before there was a Delaware County, before Delaware County and Chester County split, um, which, but presumably it still applies to us pursuant to the 1866 Act where the county split. Um, and this act provides for the creation of a board of prison inspectors to manage county prisons. Article 4 says that it's supposed to direct the manner in which all bedding, clothing, provisions, and articles and supplies necessary for the support and employment of persons combined in said prison shall be purchased, and also the sale of all articles manufactured therein. Um, section 8, then, uh, of this act talks about um, the fact that the inspectors have to go to county commissioners to pay for these things. So I look at this hodgepodge of things, and I've said, I don't understand for the life of me how we've gotten to where we've gotten. Who gave this board of prison inspectors the right to do what they do? And so I asked, the person who I thought I should ask, which is the county solicitor. And I said to him, hey, you know, why are we here? Why, why, why is this going on? And he said, not entirely sure, but, um, but I will look into it. And I followed up with him as recently as last week, and he said he'll have an answer to me either Monday or Tuesday. So um, I leave you with um, a disturbing possibility that much of what has gone on should not have gone on. And by much of what has gone on, I mean the manner in which contracts are executed here. Um, so that's something to please keep that in mind. Let's look at that going forward. Um, so one question is, does the prison board even have, have, did they have the power to enter into this contract with the GR group? And do they have the power to renew it? Um, second question that seems to me relevant is, should the county opt in to Title 61 and create a new prison oversight board that is composed, as I, as I read earlier. Um, and then number three, um, because this comes from um, this, 819, this 1839 Act as well, it says that the prison board um, shall determine the quantity and kind of food that shall be kept by the treasurer of all receipts and expenditures in said prison, which accounts shall be annually examined and settled by the auditors of said county. Uh, Joanne Phillips, the controller of Delaware County, and I have had a number of conversations where she said, we have never audited the books of the prison. Wow. $50 million contract. Wow. 
our spend the, the amount of revenue we raise in Delaware County through taxes and fees is 240 million a year. So more than 20 percent of all of the tax dollars that we get goes to Geo, and we don't audit it. And so when I asked that question on council, I was told, well, the the contract with Geo gives them the right to audit themselves. And I said, well, that's, that's a little like asking the fox to watch the hen house. Um, and then it was explained to me, well, hey, if we're not satisfied with the audit that the GEO group has done, we can do our own. And I said, okay, great. Well, can I see where we've done that? Yeah, we've, we've never really done that. So um, that's another perspective. I know it, it's, it's, it doesn't touch upon um, the profound human costs uh, uh, that were spoken of earlier and that were spoken so eloquently of here today. Um, but I think, in part, as a, as, a, as a public official, one of the things I look at is that in order for us to improve upon what goes on in George Hill, uh, we need to have a better process and a more transparent process for even running the facility. And, and, and no doubt, no matter what we do, there will, uh, there will be uh, poor outcomes from time to time. But we can, we can give ourselves the best chance possible to run George Hill in the best manner possible, I think, with a better process, a more transparent process, one that is involving of the community and one that reports back to the community. So that's what I have to say.